approve the minutes from September 10th. I read through them. I had some questions, but I assume the questions are going to be answered today. Yeah, I just need, I just need, okay. okay. Motion to approve the minutes. Okay. Glenn and Jenna. All in favor? Say aye. Okay, approved. Is there any public invited to be heard? Yeah. Okay. 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 They're always, it's always kind of like organizational updates. <coughs> Staffing is what we should focus on first here. Um, so we are interviewing for the regional manager. Uh, we have held four interviews that concluded yesterday. We're planning on shortlisting and hopefully bringing new people back early next week um, to do a broader kind of group interview and kind of dig in on people and give some scenarios and try to just dig deeper. Um, so hopefully we'll have someone hired here this month would be great. Um, on uh, Lawrence, do you decide for hiring in terms of maintenance and property managers where we are right now. We have a new property assistant community manager starting on the 21st. Um, so this will be our third that we're hiring. Um, and that will round out the property management team. Um, you know, assuming we hire regional. And then we will be hiring um, a new maintenance person. Um, we are anticipating to get more approval for the budget for next year and approval to hire that position early now because we are shortly. And then uh, our maintenance supervisor is opportunity to be through the end of December. It's part of the reason why we were short with it. So, I think we'll fully stop up. Where is your sister? She'll probably flow between um, Village on Main and Aspens. Because we have one at Fall River Spring Creek, and we have one at Sweet Cincinnati. She'll probably start learning there first, and then I'll probably also have her do some time over at Hillstone Lodge because um, Andrea is pretty much in the room that works on that property, and it's a, it's a little bit different than our other relative properties, and then I'll start having other people train over there. We need, we need to share the knowledge and the wealth of information, so. all from us. Well, that's the hope with the budget. Yeah. If we get the budget approval yeah. next week from the board, we're also going to ask them to hire another I think that's it for organizational updates. Carol, do you have anything else for that? No, okay. I'll dig into that with the budget. Okay. Okay. Development of budget updates. All right. So it was a very, very eventful month. Um, we were due to substantially complete and get a permit letter saying so um, for Village on Main by September 30th. And we ended up, yeah, that was Monday, and we got it on Friday. So we met our um, development timeline for that. That was really critical because um, with the deal that we had negotiated with the investor, we wanted that substantial completion by that time um, to not face a downward adjustment on tax credits. And we said we could do it, and we did it. Um, so that was great. There's still still work happening at Village. We had furniture installed on uh, what day was it? this last Friday, um, but there's still more coming, and we still have punch list items, and we're still doing final cleanup and that kind of thing. So we're, uh, we've got a couple holds for potential grand opening dates, but we want to see, um, There's we want more of the furniture and, and it wanted to look a little more finished because it was coming in in um, multiple orders. So it's either going to be late October or early November, and so we want to make sure that this group gets that invite because um, it looks really great. It's really beautiful, and I'm very proud of the work that was done. And the residents are all happy. Generally, at the end, they said, you know, we were so worried, and it looks great. So. Um, there's always little tweaks and fixes that you do at the end and making sure everything's 
really tip top shape, but that's where we're at now. So that was a big milestone. Um, and then for Ascent, we oh, finally I did close. Just kind of oh, sure. Um, and honestly, I didn't go by there today. So okay. Is the sign up front still say really Yes, it's getting replaced. It's coming in November. Okay. That's one of the items that we uh, were hoping to have before we invite people for a grand opening, but we also, that's not one that we might wait for because we'd rather have you better. So, yeah. um, but that is still definitely coming. We did the, the base of it to match the um, brick, but they'll just be sliding in a new insert. That would make it look very finished. Any other questions about Village? I think they're just excited that the noise is coming. Yeah, it's already a lot quieter. Yeah. The furniture looks awesome. Um, so for Ascent, we did finally close on the same day, on uh, September 27th. And so um, that was a big, big project and a big push, and we are now in construction, active construction. So I encourage everybody to drive by and just see the action. Um, that construction is anticipated to go through. Did you hear this morning if there's an updated end date? Because I never heard it. It was January, but because we pushed a few weeks, it might be February 26th at this point. I did. Okay. Expect February 26th, I'd say, but um, we could get that nailed down. Um, and so that was just a huge accomplishment. We also had a deadline of September 30th, and so we were closing it on Friday the 27th at about 6.30 p.m. our time, and we had East Coast <laughs> banks doing it at 8.30 on Friday night. It was, but if we didn't, we would have to redo all the signatures, and so it's like, we're not doing that. Yeah. So it got done. Um, are there water trucks in here? There should be water trucks for, for dust. To, to cut down on the dust. <clears throat> there should be. So I'll triple check, but okay. that is pretty standard for when you've got earth moving going on. Um, so that's a set that was a big week. And then also, two days later, um, two business days later, Zinnia opened and we had move in start. Um, so it's been a very, very Massive week. <laughs> my face looks tired because I was laying down on the doctor's table, but <laughs> I think everybody else can uh, use the excuse of the projects that we're all ready for a little bit of a let's take a breather and coast for a minute. Um, but all that settled. So it was just very big. And so they're going to be doing a grand opening as well. So between Village, we might have a ribbon cutting on Ascent. I've got to talk to the team. Um, and then um, Zinnia, there will be several grand openings or ribbon cuttings coming that you'll all get invited to. Or Zinnia, so we'll get and, and that's it. I mean, for now, for the next quarter, through the end of the year, we still have, just because you closed doesn't mean no work is over, so um, there's still a lot of work for closing out the village project and um, keeping tabs on construction for Ascent and making sure Zinnia is up and running smoothly. So that's still gonna be a big focus for the next quarter. And then we've been talking about our pipeline and um, what are we gonna start to focus on next. Um, and I think that we've always had this 121 main project we're trying to um, get early. Um, you know, we're looking at funding uh, options now to keep, try and keep that moving along if it can. And then uh, probably bringing on a consultant here in the new year to start looking at conversion of the Parson and Lodge out of the 202 program. Just kind of the next two steps to, to take on. Any questions about development projects? We've got more projects coming when we talk about the federal funding down below, but development specifically. Any questions? I'm missing anything here. Okay, I just input the one of my shooters. So I'll take this first one as well, because um, it's just going to kind of bleed into item B. So if you don't mind, I might just kind of go into both of them. Yeah. Um, so on next Tuesday night, the LHA board will be considering accepting a grant from the city for $200,000 of CBG funds to replace the doors at the suites. Um, that sounds like a lot for doors, but it's actually super critical because one of our biggest challenges at the suites has been the fact that it was a hotel conversion and the doors cause a lot of problems for those with mental health 
struggles and just generally privacy and uh, feeling safe. So there, they have giant gaps under them. Uh, they are hotel-sized doors, so they do not mean there is not a typical residential um, door that fits, so you have to do the whole frame and everything. Um, and they automatically lock when you walk out. So we have more lockout problems at the suites than any other property, which is a time sink and cost that gone staff time as well. So between um, helping the residents feel safe and comfortable in their homes and reducing our operational costs, so this was steady a no-brainer, and luckily the city's CDBG grant this year did have capacity for that. So that's going to be considered by the board here next Tuesday. So if I'm thinking of suites correctly, there's three doors that you have to go through. Is that correct? Or are you replacing all three of those? We're doors? replacing all of the, not the glass sliders, but all of the unit entry doors and then like office and maintenance doors that are all the same. Do you remember how many doors it is? We have 82 units, so it's something like 100 doors. And I think the way you want to pitch it is critical one are the unit doors. Those we have to, to, to replace. If there's if the cost comes in after we do the RFP and there's more room in the budget to do additional doors, then we'll identify probably office doors for MHP staff clinicians and property management and um, prioritize those. And then if there's still more budget after that, then the rest of the doors, because they're all the same. I, I don't want to. I don't want to spend all the money to replace stores. That we don't need to. We have to focus on our needs. So that's the first item of federal funding here on this agenda. With more to come. Is there any questions on that one specifically? Okay. Here we got something quick. Um, May. Much better. Okay. So, um, we have talked about this a bit in the past, but we have um, between from 2021 or so, and now, when the city received its ARPA funding allocation and CDBG CV, which is COVID money allocation, um, the, we've been working to use that money. So on the ARPA side, let's go share first. So this is a work in progress, but this is where we are right now. Okay, so on the ARPA side, this is what City Council dedicated towards affordable housing. It was the number was originally eight point eight five million dollars. Um, let me see the notes right now, so I'll just get even bigger. Um, and so this is how between LHA and the city, because this all really went through the city for So anything on here that's an LHA project. Um, went through an IGA from the city to LHA, but LHA was a major player here. 
So this is everything in yellow is how we have spent the $8.85 million of ARPA funds. And then as we got later uh, down the road and other groups that received ARPA allocations, either conditions changed or they had trouble, trouble spending the money, we have been the final bucket that can, can spend the money because we have a lot of need. And so these are all of the properties that have been served for by ARPA funds. And then down at the bottom, uh, once we started to swoop in additional funds, this is what this is ending up looking like. So everything in yellow is spent. I'll go over a couple of anomalies up here first. So this was a loan. So we uh, loaned MGL the securities through LIJ, the uh, public improvement securities for construction. They will pay that back once they receive construction acceptance from the city. And so we've already gotten 65,000 of that back, um, but the rest will come next year. And so that is all as it gets paid back is dumping into this bucket right here, which is our staffing, which is how we've paid for Katie Plum, our development project manager. Um, so that will dump back into that bucket to pay for her for 2025. Um, and then, so I'm I'm sorry? How much is left? Either I didn't talk about that. How much is left for Katie? Um, we have been running the projections to make sure there's enough to get through 25. So it should be something like October. It should be something on the order of 130. Okay. Something. We've been running periodic projections to make sure we're on track. And either way, if we do run out, we've got her. Yeah, it's, it's quite a good Okay, and then this was our first, oh, I should mention these two. Um, these two were projects that we had in mind when we first discussed receiving this funding. Um, the next light bulb agreements was something that we wanted to do at LHA to give all residents access to next light for free, but then the um, federal government came in on the broadband side and ended up with a program that did functionally the same thing, so we held off on that. Um, that is something we would still like to do in the future, but there is a cost associated, so we would need to figure out a funding source. Um, but that that program is either still going or has just recently ended. I think it's ended. It's ended. But, but some companies are still continuing that on our Yes, and even so, if you uh, live in our properties, you qualify for the, there are other programs through Longmont that help and so you can get it next light still for something like sixteen dollars a month. Yeah, next light still do it. We're we're mimicking the federal program. We're just doing it internally, yes. but we think there's more money coming. So that's good. Yeah. So we're keeping tabs. The unhoused project, this one was a real challenging one. Um, we didn't we knew that we wanted originally to fund about one point five million to, into a project that served the unhoused. We didn't know if that looked like um, something in the area of sheltering or um, or housing or something creative in between. In the end, that is a really complex um, problem to solve and we the time constraints on the money did not help there. And then plus we ended up putting money into Zinnia, which did serve um, the similar population that we're trying to serve here. Um, and because the opportunity came up to do an affordable home ownership on the city side, um, that that is a rare opportunity, and so the council made the decision to go ahead and swap that for now. Still, obviously, keeping tabs on unhoused and how we can best serve them. Okay, so here's what um, the upcoming swoop that we anticipate to be able to spend this money. Um, really what it is, is all this money has to be obligated, which is kind of like contracted in the simplest term. Um, by the end of this year in order to keep it. So we are the ones that can contract this, partially because we can do an IGA with LHA, but that also is considered obligated. Um, and so we're swooping more funds. And so what we're working with here, this is all the ADA improvements that we did. We actually, in this phase one of LHA accessibility, this is, came out of the voluntary compliance agreement and the massive report of ADA corrections that we have to um, complete in the next seven years. Well, I should say six now, we've been through one. Um, so we did a lot of work with that one, but we still have work to do, so we're continuing that. This is primarily right now um, uh, asphalt 
work to redo ADA parking spaces or trip hazards, and then concrete work to do new ADA ramps and trip hazards. Um, and concrete is, is expensive. So right now I'm working um, with a couple of contracts to, contractors to get bids. I'm working this in conjunction with about $40,000, $5,000 of additional CV funds that's going to also help with the asphalt and concrete work. And then we still have more we could do if the funding came out. So um, working to get that all squared away so that we can have everything contracted by the end of the year. Um, I should, the final CV amount that we used is also on the order of $140,000, but I'll double check that number. But so it's all pairing together. In the end, it's going to be $250,000 worth of ADA improvements that we've done between the two funding sources. Um, LHA cameras, this is something we've been working on for two years to get our security cameras all onto one integrated system. Um, we're again using $83,000 of regular CPBG money in conjunction with ARPA funds to get these cameras going. It's also a $250,000 project um, to get the equipment, the licensing, the install, and then we'll have to keep up with them on time payments. Um, mm -hmm. That's your question. Yeah. In house, sort of focused on how we put it in house. So the housing authority's role is more in creating and managing the housing. So permanent supportive housing is often the first step out of being unhoused. And so running the suites in Zinnia is the primary focus of LHA. On the city side, a lot of unhoused work regarding coordinated entry out into the housing, whether it's through LHA or elsewhere, and providing services all comes from the human services department. Is there a homeless program that exists in Walmart? So what are you, it's, a, it's kind of a difficult question to answer. So um, as a county, we all operate under coordinated entry. And so that's a very defined program of which there are multiple groups that work with that program. Um, and so that's a piece of it. And then in terms of the nonprofit support, that's where Hope slides in. And so that, that's a piece of it where they're operating L there for us, but then we also have people in the public safety department that have re been repurposed where they work in conjunction with them. But all of that funnels itself into coordinated entry. Then once they get into coordinated entry, that's when we start moving people on the road of housing. And so I think hoping that group would house what like eighty in the last year? Yeah. I think between seventy and eighty. Between seventy and eighty people that they housed. So there's not a singular group that does it. It is multiple groups that are contributing into the coordinated entry process. Is there any group that presents statistics on Homelessness, like, you know, what makes it up as an example? You know, how many people want to be homeless? How many people are you know, yeah. getting evicted? And when I say want to be homeless, I don't believe anybody wants to be homeless. I believe some people say that when they're afraid to go to the housing stuff. But where, if anybody that coordinates, if, if I want a picture of homelessness, yeah. where would I go? So we're actually, Public Safety right now is gathering that data. Uh, different, uh, it's different than a point in time survey. So the county does a point in time survey where everyone goes out and asks some questions. But we, uh, as Public Safety, our chief wanted more information as far as, you know, what resources are you, you using? What else do you need? Um, so we're really diving into that. And I think that data collection will end at the end of this month. And then I'm assuming the chief will be presenting that to the council or some, some of the information will get out somehow. Yeah, I mean, so part of it with the data, so you have to do a point in time survey because that's really what that requires. Mm -hmm. The data they're doing is, is going to be an ongoing collection of data as they're interacting with people. The thing that I think we have to keep in mind is that it's always changing. In that what we see 
what we're seeing now is not what we'll see in December, and it's not what we're going to see in March. Um, because I think what when we look at who, who the, the individuals were housing, so typically those individuals that get housed are people that you would are the unhoused individuals that aren't the people that you see. So it's people that are living in their cars. Or, um, in some cases, it's people that you're seeing, but they're maybe camping, but actually working and doing other things. Because, you know, when you get into, I think the group that you're probably talking about is a group that we see, that is um, a completely different set of issues that we're starting to tease out. Uh, that we're challenged with and you know most of that is rooted into a couple of things one mental health and substance abuse and I think in some of those cases they're hand in hand but substance abuse is probably the most prolific issue we have and to give you an example of some of the challenges the substance abuse is so significant that until there is a treatment component most are choosing to remain unhoused because they don't want to stop utilizing illegal substances. Even to the point where we've had individuals who have had very significant health conditions. Um, and I don't even know if the guy still matters or not. Jack? Yeah. He's actually in Boulder with his, his girlfriend. Yeah. She's housed. Okay. And, no, this is a different guy. No, this is a different guy, but the, um, the issue that we were really dealing with is, um, so like if you're using methamphetamine that has oxygen in it, then it's a flesh eating piece. And so individual, for example, that literally had that going on um, with more chronic issues, you know, might get some things, right? Repeatedly tried to get into the hospital, but repeatedly denied, uh, didn't get us the ability to do that. And the reason was because they couldn't get the And so, you know, you've heard me use the onion analogy. It really is layers and layers and layers in terms of what you're dealing with. But, you know, in many cases, what you'll see is police, um, lead core, some version of that group. And so they have a meeting where they get together, hope gets together, all the folks are talking, so it's really this interconnected web. But um, it's hard for us to give you a singular answer as we say why. Because it really is dependent on these different levels. But if we had to say, why don't people want to be housed, like we are seeing in the data that for some that just want to remain in house. I think it's driven by drugs. But I don't have any yeah. yeah. I don't have anything that's in the house. Yeah, no, no, no. Every Friday I'm part of a problem that pushes people at home and space. Right. You know, so the longer I'm doing this, the more I'm getting into this group. No, no, I don't. It happens it's, once I push them out the door. No, this is just an opportunity for us to talk about it. That's why I'm kind of digging in a little bit. And you're right. I mean, and typically, what do you see when you're on the eviction side, at least from the housing authority perspective? You know, our evictions tend to always be related to behavior or drugs. And you know, the challenge with that is when you have people living in these facilities, first and foremost, you have to look at um, the health, safety, and welfare of all the residents in the units. And so it is it is troubling when you have to come in and you, you house someone and a month later you have to evict them because that's happened to us. Or six months later, you have to evict them, but you can't let the behaviors continue to where it's now creating problems with other individuals, and especially when you have individuals that are in recovery. And we had some issues at the suites, what was that, Sarah, about two or three years ago, where the individual was dealing? Oh, yeah. So when you have people that are in recovery, and you have somebody that's in the facility that then starts trying to deal 
now all of a sudden they're not just destabilizing themselves, they're destabilizing others, I think so. Yeah. So that's a nutshell of what we're doing. Okay. But we can talk three hours of this. <laughs> That'd be great. Yeah. I never thought about it until I saw it up here. I mean, I didn't, yeah. I, I didn't tell me how to be until I saw that. I was just curious to how much we're doing. So, on this that Molly's presenting, so a few things that we had to do. Uh, and there's my answer question about the staffing. So, Molly talked about how we have to get contracts in place because if you don't have contracts, you can't pull the money over if you don't spend it. Part of the broader ARPA funding that we used, we created positions to try to get at some of the issues, specifically like in neighborhoods. So we created a neighborhood, what, was, what are those positions? Somebody remember it, neighborhood outreach. When was in um, Emily's group that was... Um, that was Alejandro. Um, um, and then he would get in permanent. But, but it was, it's basically case management and yeah. outreach. The challenge that we're having there is that some of those positions were between us, so when we built it, we built it in terms of, it was like a four or five year term position, which is more, people tend to want to go into this. But what started happening is, what we're finding in our staffing challenges generally, some of them start working for us, and we would pay $28 an hour, or then they would use it in the experience, which on them to then leverage getting a higher level position or moving into a permanent position if we have it. So what we started seeing, uh, what Peter started seeing as we were approaching this is, if there was an area where we were really concerned about having to send money back to the feds because we weren't using it, it's because we would have vacancies in, in these positions and, and if you don't have it set up, to sweep the money over and then it just goes back. So we did a few things. We ended up taking the interest earnings that we have, we've been making on the um, funds because it's just been in the bank. You have more flexibility with the interest that you're making on it. So I actually flipped the funding on, on the positions. So I'm going to the interest over to fund the positions. I moved the actual ARPA dollars over to fund these projects. Now, I am having meetings, so that you see the $6,000 placeholder, mm -hmm. it literally is just a placeholder. We had to put some money in an account to fund it so that then after the end of the year, if we have other money, we can pull it in. Globally, I'm going to start meeting, I've got a meeting set up at some point with all of these folks to look at the staffing and whether or not we really realistically think we're going to be able to fill the positions because now we're in a two-year two window for those positions and so every month that goes by, the likelihood of filling it goes down because people don't want a two-year year term position. So what we'll do is we're going to make some decisions on those positions and then as we're making those decisions, if we have excess funds, we're going to drive it down into um, either the accessibility piece, which is the parking lots and sidewalks, or we're going to push it into the unit terms. You say the money goes back. To the federal government. Does it also result in a decrease in the street? No, because this is CD. This is um, COVID relief funds, but does it impact how they look at other significant events in the future potential? So the more efficient, the, the more efficient and effective you are at using your dollars, the, if you have another disaster or something that comes in, the more they're going to say, yeah, this group can spend the money, meet the requirements, and, and, and accomplish what we want to accomplish with this. Um, and so, and we do know that if there's lingering effects still from COVID, it really is in the affordable housing world. Um, we're still seeing issues. 
And part of that was because what you're also seeing in the rental assistance program, why I think affordable housing is so important as you're coming out of COVID, is they pushed a lot of money out for rental assistance. What's happening as that money goes away, you know, I think thinking through it, we probably could have done something a little bit different because what you wanted, what you wanted is stabilizing COVID and then have people wean themselves off of it. The rental assistance. The reality is they didn't. And you're probably seeing it. And the people are getting evicted because they just got accustomed to the rental assistance and never wean themselves off. And now there's not money available. So um, when, when you take all of this in play, these things about building more units and, and um, you know, improving the units is incredibly important because we don't need the units now, we need them up so that we can house individuals that are caught in the situation. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a bit maddening, but I think we're set up now. So, Harold, do you see us having a problem here, like California is with light tech hitting their 30 year um, mark? and the uh, places are going to market instead of affordable. So one of our properties have a covenant that yeah. runs with the land forever. Yeah, so... There's a lot of affordable covenants that keep it affordable for people to do it. See, it depends on what you can buy it for itself. Yeah, it's more like private affordable housing yeah. developers yeah, that want to do it one time. Yeah. So it depends, right? So when we invest money in affordable housing, whether it's through the affordable housing fund, those covenants are in perpetuity. And so even if we're not the owner, but you're the owner and you do it, you would have to buy out of that covenant um, if you wanted to take it to market rates. Um, you know, I think what we're seeing on the West Coast is, and I think we're going to see that it's more than just California, is what they were doing is facilitating these light tech deals but they didn't have the covenants on the back side or they didn't have first right of refusals and so now they're caught in that trap of okay i've done what i need to do i'm converting it into market rate because they didn't have these other parameters i know what we do as special limited partnership we include that okay. all right to some level I can't think of one that we've done because most of them took affordable housing. Though, yeah, so we problem. had, there was a gap in time. So LHA did a lot of SLPs in history, but I would say in, I don't know how many years to call it, let's say five to 10 years before the city came in, affordable housing projects did come into Longmont and did not use LHA as an SLP. But they did access the city's affordable housing funds, which we did add a layer of protection there. Um, we have had two <coughs> developers of existing, uh, two owners of existing affordable housing come to us now and ask for that SLP relationship now. So that's something that um, is an ongoing potential, and at that point we could negotiate something like that. But also those deals are done, so we have to see what is already built in for that too. Um, but. Yeah. Um, so what we didn't go into is what is the unit terms contract. Um, because of our staffing shortage on the maintenance side and just the last, you know, the turmoil that we've had in the last year in terms of getting, um, making sure that we have stable staff and um, we had Meth units, which is not just this year, I think it's actually been lower than average this year. Um, but just with what is going on, we do not want to reach the end of the year and have vacancies that should be filled. And so um, that serves the purpose of affordable housing to get these units ready to go when LHA doesn't have the resources to do so otherwise. So we're working on procuring an on call contract for janitorial and um, maintenance for things like we have to redo flooring to get a unit turned because we have a number of units that are 
needing this now, and we want them to look at you. Yes. So that's something that we can do. So this is taking it away from maintenance, then, and this person or persons yes. would go in and place it. Not in perpetuity. So this is a, a catch-up. Um, I do think the custodial piece, like we talked about, is probably something that makes more sense for us to look at on an ongoing basis. Um, the maintenance is going to be um, unit-specific in terms of what we're doing. But we also are adding a, a maintenance person, so we're going to assess what the ROI is on, on projects. I think that's something we need to into it is what's the value of time versus money and then on Kendra's side rent because we could save fifteen thousand dollars and it takes us nine months to do or we could lose the rent which is you know we, we've got to start doing that evaluation um, and, and determining who the right group to do unit terms. So that was what came up last time. Mm -hmm. you know, so how fast can we drill? Okay. Yeah, this is a follow-up to the conversation we had at the last meeting. We were able to figure out the plan. Okay. How the waiting I would have to pull that. We have a, we refresh the waiting list as soon as they get stale or too short. But we do you have any Examples off the top of my head of what one of the wait lists looks like right now. Parsons yes. Lodge is always the longest. There are probably 50, 60 people doing that all times. So, do you have people signing here? No. So, when it comes to the unit terms and people vacating, it's kind of a chicken and egg game of who's ready first. My philosophy and what I tell the staff is in a, in a perfect scenario when you're fully staffed and you have capacity, unit terms should be happening as soon as you know there's a vacancy coming. The person vacates the unit, you should be getting that unit ready because you don't know how quickly someone from the wait list is going to come up. Some people take a couple days to respond, they might have to get more paperwork, the application process can take a week. So, you don't want one only waiting on the other, and that's what was happening in the past was there was a lack of communication between the property management and the maintenance. And the property manager was telling maintenance, Oh, you don't need to turn the unit, we don't have anybody yet. Then they would get someone, and then that person would have to wait a week or two for the unit to be made ready. So we want to avoid that and have them both simultaneously working, getting people assigned and through the application process while the, the unit is being turned and made ready quickly. Because we're losing money, and I actually added that into the operations report this time to show how big of a need this is. And this isn't this isn't this is a continuation of an ongoing issue that only was made worse by weeks of vacating that now we have this means. Yeah. And um, I can't say more in detail about some of that, but there were good changes, but it's painful in the process. Mm -hmm. okay. um, the Zinnia Tenant Damages Fund, that's something that we're funding out of our public interest, that non-federalized money, um, but this, you'll hear more about this in November because we'll have an IGA coming for consideration in November. So um, we'll bring that back to dig in a little bit more, but that's also in the mix. So in total, we will end up spending, assuming we are able to sweep all of this, which is the hope, um, between all of the COVID-related money, we will be spending, in my window, uh, almost $9.4 million on affordable housing. From the first expenditure was, uh, I think Christmas is the first one we put through. Well, we did do the Mustang one later. Either way, since 2022. So in about three years, 2022, 23, 24, um, we'll have spent about $9.4 million, which is awesome. So I'll be presenting this to um, the LHA board as well because we have to get some budget authorizations to enter into some of these contracts while the IGAs are still in progress. Um, so that's all coming together. It's Progress this week. Is that next week? Yeah, next Tuesday. Tuesday. Okay. Right. We're sharing. That's item 8 in. Okay. Now I'm assuming it's over that this is weird. That's me. Yeah.
or not. <laughs> it's the Josh has lost all the years. Josh says he's lost audio. Hey, I got your guys back. I just lost you right there at the tail end. <laughs> so budget. <laughs> 2025 budget. Um, there's still some things coming in. Um, some things may change by, by next week. Just the developer fees that are changing. Um, just because of how they they're they're projected, but then that's not how they end up coming through. <laughs> so what I have projected last year has changed. So there's a couple numbers that I've updated for LHA based on what developer fees are expected to come in now. Um, but other than that, some of the challenges, and these are going to be the same challenges we have every year, which is revenue uncertainty. We have the HCB vouchers; those are portable. Um, we did decide to kind of take a portion of those HCP vouchers and budget against them because what we were seeing is some properties, um, and, and I'm going to use Spring Creek as an example, they have like 19 HCP vouchers. So if we don't budget a little portion of them, even though it's coming in, and we could have expenditures that they can use um, for just everyday use, you know, landscaping that type of stuff, we wanted to try and budget a little um, so that it's ready and available for the year. Um, so we did do that. Um, developer fees, that's also dependent on cash flow. Again, those are the numbers that are changing because based on cash flow of these properties, the developer fees change on when on when they actually get paid out or when they can't get paid out. We have the projected schedule, but that's not necessarily how it ends up falling. And so that's updated every year. Um, we have inflationary costs. We're seeing those across the board. Um, that could be insurance. Insurance was probably a 12% increase. Um, we have benefits that are coming through that um, are health insurance and another 12% increase. Um, so as far as benefits, and we're also moving, normally we, we budget at 101% of market for our employees, um, but we're only budgeting at 100% this year because we just can't. With the, with the benefits increase and insurance increase, we just can't um, go up to that level this year. So for the Hearthstone and Lodge, they have been submitted to HUD. Um, the Lodge has an increase of 4.27, and the Hearthstone is an increase of 5.15. Um, they did come back, so, so we send it, and then they come back and they'll tell us, so, fund this. Um, last year they decided that certain things that you would think are preventative maintenance or things that you would normally have on an annual basis like carpet cleaning, um, they took out of the budget and said we had to submit those to our replacement officers. So there's certain things that they're taking out to accommodate what they can increase. And we did get pretty upfronted um, in 2022 and 2023, they gave us more than usual. Um, usually, the expected increase is 4 to 5 percent. Um, the HUD will in the house, and we try to keep within those limits because it, it <coughs> we didn't get our contracts until like May of 2024. Um, and the lodge <coughs> contract expires in December, and the Hearthstone expires in January. So, LHA was upfront money until we could actually get that contract. So for these two, this is not actual increases on their people's rent, right? Correct. Um, okay. For this one, um, it's basically 30% or 30 percent um, of their, their income. And so unless their income changes, that's when they see their numbers. Same with the suites. The suites is 100% um, PPP vouchers. Um, we are, because we are in a short term, we are not requesting an increase in those voucher to fair market rents. So we are keeping the studio apartment one bedroom and two bedrooms at the same that we with the last year. Um, and then same, these individuals aren't affected unless they're in the church. So the Zinnia rates right now, um, those are uh, voucher rates. Um, and they were projected at um, 
thousands of sudden bucket. So that's what, and same thing, they're fully funded by state vouchers, not federal vouchers. Um, and so that's the same situation. Tenants will only pay what their um, allotted income is based on the tax credit, which I think was all well the same. So it's good. Somebody have a question going on? The one thing I would point out on Zinnia, where we have to think about it in a slightly different way, is that we're not in the ownership structure. So we're contracted property management. So on that side, you know, if there are issues with meth contamination and things like that, those are not necessarily issues that we have to worry about and, and we'll bear that that's the owner. And and so it's, there's just a nuance to Zinnia that I wanted to make you all aware of. And in that it really is a contractual relationship where they pay us to do certain things. You don't necessarily in this case have that broader exposure. Do you ever think you will own it through LHA? Pardon? Do you ever think you will own the property through LHA? They've openly talked about wanting to sell it to us. Um, you know, I think there's some things that we need to, to be careful and think through based on some of the requirements that are on the property and how we need to approach it and some liability issues that we need to be very careful with. Um, but yeah, they talked about it. Wanted to. So. So for the rest of our properties, um, we are going to do a five percent rental increase. Um, now realize that is, it could be that's the maximum. So maximum would be five percent increase. But if they're already at close to the tax credit rent, and the tax credit rent only increases three percent, then that will be there because we can't go over that one. So it all depends on where they fall. Um, you know, if they were brought in under the tax credit, they might see the five percent increase. And then we notice, notice the tenants still going out after budget approval. And there's some, some of the affecting the person just on well, it, it, the notice kind of, I think, is kind of twofold because you can't separate the voucher individuals from the regular tenants because they, they post this. So it'll be not only, if, if you're not voucher funded, right, your outcome's different because it's only based on your income. If your income increases, your rent increases. I'm saying so, the notice is a general notice that this is happening. Yes. It's not an individual right. notice. No, they'll get the individual notice yeah. at their recent appointment. Now, so typically what we do in that case is I will go to coffee and I'm going to get the schedule. But once we do this, we'll get the notice out. And I go to coffee and conversations. Kendra will join me and we'll say, so here's what's going to happen. Here's what's driving the rental increase. And it's everything we told you, inflation basic things and then we're really pointed because we do get into those conversations yeah. and it's you need to make the appointment you know with you know it'll happen during recertification if you have a recertification coming up make the appointment as soon as possible so you can figure it out if it's later in the year and you're concerned about it schedule an appointment with the property manager so you can go over those issues because there's no way we can do it individually with no, all of the ones. Yeah. And we found that works fairly neat. So for our vouchers, um, Currently in a short call, we have a meeting with HUD on Thursday um, to go over that short call um, to see if we can get additional funding. Right now, what we're expected to bring to the board is for those that 
are currently at the fair market rents that were instituted in 2024. So these below it, so 1585, 1523. If they are currently already at that rate, they'll just be frozen. They would be able to request an increase. We may request one, but we'd have to delay. Um, and then for 2025, we would actually institute the 2025s for those that are not at that level yet. Because we have about 200 plus vouchers currently that are under the 2025 expected fair market rents. And so to help protect ourselves from getting an additional million dollar shortfall next year, we want to make sure that those individuals only go up to the 2025 rates. So that's what we're proposing. We're also going to talk it through the climate on Thursday. Because um, that will, that, I mean, we'll be in another conversation with HUD next year. Because it's about, um, the numbers are about if, if we stayed at the 2024 rates for all of our vouchers and every single landlord went up to the fair market rent, it would be another $100,000 per month. Per year, so it's another million dollars that could happen. Now, yeah. that's obviously staggered based on what their certifications are too. But um, we want to be more conservative. Which, if we go with conservative approach, they could be six to seven thousand dollars per month um, per year. So landlords aren't going to get the <coughs> if you have voucher holders, you're not going to get a reduction in the tenant. You just might not be able to raise the rent. Right. Or you could raise it to the, I mean, a lot of right. others, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Or you could get it to the 2025 rate, if you're not there already. Yeah. Well, I mean, they could technically raise it when they need to raise it. This well, yeah. is all we're going to pay. Yeah, yeah. 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 The, the yeah. individual then has to make up that difference. Yeah. The tenant would have to make up the difference. We just didn't want to do that for the ones that were already the 2025 to have the bigger cost. And it, it, according to HUD, that's not allowed. You have to actually give every year's notice to those individuals uh, to give them time to do that for the reduction. So. so we've had one conversation with HUD. I think we learned a lot in that conversation. Um, and, and the margins are really fine on this. You know, I, I think some groups play a little too, and this is broader housing authorities, will play a little bit too fast and loose with this. And because if you go in the shortfall and they fund it, then you get that number the following year. And, and I think some are more intentional about being in shortfall. And so what that does is that's how they're getting more money. The challenge with it, and I think this year is, you know, pretty important to watch this, is that, you know, that is dependent on the budget being approved at the federal level. And so we've all seen the continuing appropriation saga. And so if you're playing that game, it could fight you if they don't fight you. Now, what we did is just actually utilize our vouchers. And then we got in a period of, you know, just incredible inflation and rental costs and a lack of units. And, and so I think it's a better story than what we're saying. But that's what you have to watch. I think the other thing is, you know, they give you this number of 4% that you need to stay at. I think we've been treating the 4% as sort of a floor in terms of reserves. Well, it's interesting because if you're over 4%, they can sweep your reserves. And so the more you listen to them, it's almost like Kendra and I have been talking about this. It's, do we want to set a two and a half, three percent 3% reserves to avoid the potential sweep because the way they find those that are in our situation 
is that they're sweeping money from other people who aren't using it. So for years, I guess what's been happening to us is when we weren't using that money, I was sweeping it and moving it to other housing authorities, but we didn't really know that. Um, so it's been an interesting learning experience. And that's why they have the two tool. <laughs> because in one month, and actually it's kind of a three year tool if you look at it, but in one month, you can go to being at 4% and go down to two. Just for, depending on how many vouchers you have in that month, and a lot of them try to time their vouchers so that you have a steady amount of voucher recertifications each month, you don't have a huge, uh, a huge jump. But when you have people, Vouchers. So we'll have that. <laughs> so if all those individuals stay in those units uh, for the next year. So, so other new items in 2025 um, will be added to a new accounting position. Um, and and partly because we're all over exceeded in our workload right now, but we also want to be able to do and maintain our separation duties. I also feel that in the housing department, we need to provide additional reports that <coughs> the deadline, what's happening on the financial side, and we just haven't had the deadline to do that. And that this position would also be providing those reports. Uh, more detailed data coming through the system for operational purposes and management purposes. Um, we are going to do a maintenance position to support Little John and Firewood and have Patrick be more of a supervisor role um, so that he can tackle that and make sure somebody is managing and supervising the unit terms and he's not having all the unit terms in the process. So, we were able to do that. Um, budget increases and decreases. We have a 12% plan increase in benefits. Um, and then with that, we have to bring the salaries at 100%. Is that going to cause a problem with hiring people where we've gone to 100% so better than what? No, because most, most everybody is still getting an increase. So it's not like freezing them. Um, so most of them are still getting an increase at 100%. I, I mean, most places are probably at 100%. Um, and we seem to be pretty fair with what we looked at in the market. We, te we tend to look at other positions that are in the market, and we seem to be right there or even higher. We did look. We did an effort this whole last year to benchmark all the positions and make sure everything is pretty aligned to market right now, based on the data that we have. So I'm pretty confident that we've got our salaries well aligned and even with the 101 to 100 um, the, because the benchmark moves that they would generally be getting some level of increase on the most part. And even with this, we do budget an exceptional pay increase to you know, in case that is warranted. Um, and then we have a new position in the So part of what's in this, so we did this in conjunction with the city's position. So what we're the thing that's telling us is we're assuming a three percent adjustment to the range market, which moves a bit point three percent. So if there's someone that wouldn't get an increase, it's someone that may have been let's say they were at a hundred and three percent because of exceptional pain. Get exceptional pay this year, and they would be relatively flat. But that's just the general movement. We do benchmark these positions individually, and we saw a lot of movement in the benchmarks. So when we say 3%, that's like the minimum. In many cases, what we're finding are positions are moving 5%, 7% because of the market itself. Your accounting position. Is that, I've got this question. Do you have the 
the tools to generate the kind of stuff we're talking about generating? Or is this a position because it's still a lot of money? No, I mean, we have, so the problem is we've added, so we have added additional properties. We've added some city properties. We've added Zinnia and the Senate is coming on board. Like most of, uh, like my account right now is pretty strapped to get all of the financials prepped and open for me to review the debt that they get. Yeah, yeah, so it's it's workload. It's the number of payables that are going to be coming in the door. It's the number of debt reps we have on each one of these properties, which is anywhere from three to four different bank reps for each property. So it's just, it's, it's come to a point where we're just a little that makes sense, but I think my question is still going. Are there more tools that you could use that would help manage this that you don't have? Oh, well, we just had a yardy training this last week and found out there's a lot of tools that were never built in our system. And this is just not for accounting, it's also for the property managers. So I do think, I mean, obviously, bad data in is bad data out. And so there's probably going to be some money per. In the beginning, to make sure that the data that we're seeing out of them is is correct and true, but there is so much that was never set up for us. Um, they have to the property managers have to do everything from the lease to the letters to the um, to the wait list. Their wait list right now is currently in its own spreadsheet, so they're not utilizing the system. Of the and there was a lot of there was a lot of we went on moments. It was like watching fireworks sometimes, yeah. just finding the shortcuts, you know, the shortcuts to, to ease their their day, their day of job, um, to be able to produce reports um, and build reports. You know, if you need a, a list of tenants and their phone numbers, you know, a lot of them didn't have the ability for having a the process of doing that on the side. So, so do you manage that or is that an IT department? Oh no, I'm IT too. <laughs> yeah, I'm IT for yardy. Um, but but what I would say is that bringing the groups together made a huge difference. Like on their abilities, um, what they can do in the system. We are currently in the process of doing an implementation too for two packages, um, which is, um, we didn't know it was two for implementations, but it's right now, okay? So that would be on both on the voucher side. So that one has already started. Um, the political side will start here soon. Um, but it's two different implementation teams to actually, um, so tenants will be able to do reports, they'll be able to pay. Um, all through a portal system and do their research on the upload documentation, a more streamlined approach. But we're also building it so that uh, community managers can also assist those because we do have an elderly population that they may need assistance. So, you know, sometimes it's just reading stuff on the computer, right? Because it's not um, as long even for me. It's not, <laughs> it's not big enough sometimes, but you know, we are building it so that. That's not the only way that they can do the research, or the only way that the, the community managers can assist in as well. So, these pieces of the system that haven't been set up, is that something your department would have to do, or is that something you have to pay your idea to do? Well, we're, well currently, we're, so we already made the RD to implement this package, um, and it's basically just for getting it set up right now. So, they're going through testing periods. Um, they set certain pieces up. It's a it's a huge project, especially especially on the voucher side. It's going to take about six months to get it implemented because there's so many different pieces that have to that, that have to go through. And then the other thing that will be nice is that people will be able to log on and actually add themselves to it. So part of it, this is sort of the yardy hangover that we can't seem to get over. <laughs> And uh, when the Housing Authority purchased Yardy in the transition, if you remember, they didn't move records over. They were still working in the old system, sort of doing both. They basically bought the Lamborghini of systems. But they implemented 
uh, the cool. Corona version <laughs> of, the sim of the system. So the reality is the tools are there. They've never been triggered to be utilized. And as we were sliding in, we never had the staff fully engage in it. So part of, I think, what we can get out of adding the accounting position is that if we can manage the workload, then those positions can work with Kendra so that we are more able to utilize the tools and do things internally. So part of it is we pay for things we're not, we, the collective we, over time, pay for things that are not being utilized. Can they just be turned on? Or Some of it is like just them uploading the package to Kendra and then they have to have some breaks in the system, so I, their IT is going to have to get involved. Um, you should be able to hit the help button, and it pulls up exactly all the help you need to, to toggle through that screen, and all of those pictures. So just little nuances. They didn't set up any letters um, on the affordable side. So I mean, it's, it's producing those letters. It's getting those letters up to, uh, uploaded, and there's apparently a tool that Upload it if you change that. So, I have one more question. Yeah. 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 Do you run that system or is it remotely run from I, I do not run the system. Cloud -based. <laughs> yeah, it's a cloud based, it's a cloud -based. It's a cloud -based system. So it's scalable. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, in order to end on time, I'm going to So, so can I ask just a couple of beginning questions before you actually get into this? Yep. Okay. Can you explain to me again what tenant services is? So tenant services can be different, different things in different properties. So um, what you're probably seeing at most of these properties is LAJ last year took the resource specialist who was at um, Hearthstone, the Lodge, and the Suites and transition that individual because their background wasn't the best for the student's population. We needed more of a clinician at those. So LHA paid for the resource specialists to do, they come to the property soon. Four hours a week, I think I may have. Yeah, that's what you um, And so what we were able to do this year is bring that down to the property level so that LHA could hire the maintenance, hire the accounting, um, and, and absorb what they needed to absorb based on the increases. So that's what you're seeing in most of these properties is that sometimes um, for the suites, it could be, if we also provided the suites, cable, uh, telephone, internet. So that's that's fully paid for um, for all of the tenants at the suites and that of all the tenant services for the Hearthstone and Lodge. They have the dependent system, um, and that's a requirement for those properties. Um, they used to have pool court, but we went to a, a, a pendant system, so that you'll see in tenant services. And then what also is in tenant services is if there's uh, a budget for tenant activities and services. Mm -hmm. So that's what kind of sums up those. So you also see that. Okay. So then the other thing was, so I noticed that in some of them we have a meth reserve and some of them we don't. Yes, because uh, that was based on budget. So okay. it's not a requirement for these properties to have a meth reserve. We started that a couple of years ago. But this year, okay. There was there was more needs at the property after meeting with community managers and the maintenance team that between landscaping and equipment and stuff like that it just didn't fit in the budget. So we added them where I, I added them where I could um, and, and realized anything that's below the line, I mean obviously developer fees based on cash flow placement is required and so is any type of mortgage. We need to make sure we can pay for those. But in the end, if we can't fund the $10,000 or $5,000 in that, then we can't do that. But it's it's in the budget to hopefully do that. But you never know what's going to happen <laughs> at these properties. 
So I don't know if you want to go through all of these, um, or if you just, so what this does is it's for revenue purposes, it's going to tell you what you're budgeting for revenue, but down here at the bottom of the <coughs> section, it'll let you know how many HCD vouchers we have and what is possible to also come in via revenue that we haven't budgeted. Um, so to give you that, just to give you an idea of that. Um, I don't know if you guys want to go to, I mean, to go detail or detail. Do you guys have any questions on this or any questions on any properties? Well, I kind of went through the government calculator out without how it came up with me because I couldn't do it in my head. <laughs> yeah, so behind this. There's a multi tab, hundreds of line spreadsheets mm -hmm. of where they're being broken down by properties. And so we didn't figure I mean, it's, it's just a lot of information. So we're, we're rolling everything up to present to you all. I think the big piece, again, for those that weren't here is when we took over, there were a lot of properties that were budgeting in the negative. And so obviously you can see some. Some of these are doing well. I mean, everything's in positive in terms of what we're looking at. I think, yeah. Yeah. Um, we'll go straight to this. So, we'll go straight to the LHA general fund if nobody has any questions about these lines. Well, I guess the only question has, that has come up in several different places is the event fund. Yeah. It's okay. not changing. So, okay, that's good. Um, yeah. So, it didn't, that's kind of I didn't increase it, but it didn't. Increase either. Okay. <laughs> so we kind of did a, a little something a little different this year, um, and that is taking the developer fee revenue and then also adding a developer fee expense so you can kind of see exactly what of our general fund we we're using um, and how it changes from year to year as you add properties and get the management fees. So in 2025, our current revenue consists of um, management fees and snow removal. Um, we are, in 2024, we did also have $150,000 from LHTC, that's a corporate management fee. But they're going more to a structure of providing assistance at the Hearthstone and the large properties, which are theirs, that they're assisting in amounts that we could not get funded by HUD. So um, even though we lost that, we still didn't lose too much because we added um, Zidian to our portfolio um, and our daily management fees from that. So in this year, we're probably going to be using about $888,000 from our general fund. Um, last year, we also had the resource specialist that was allocated at early We were able to move that to the property level. Um, we were also paying for some of the speed security and the patrols. Um, the, the patrols are going to be changing to more of a camera monitoring focus, um, but we were able to get the full security contract back down to the streets as well. So, I mean, this the the story in this is that last year, if you look at the fund balance meeting at 905, and then you look at the fund balance meeting at 888, and remember that's related to developer fees, and we talked about wanting a more sustainable revenue source. So the interesting piece is we didn't, so it decreased in what we're pulling out of the fund balance based on what we're projecting. Balance that with the fact that we've added two positions and made all the adjustments that Kendrick's talking about. So, you know, we've added operationally a couple of hundred, probably a couple hundred thousand in expenses, but we're drawing less out of fund balance. And that's because of the revenue structures coming in from real properties with those ongoing revenue sources. And so um, that's really the big takeaway from this is that you're we're still trending in the right direction in terms of having sustainable ongoing funding sources and not relying solely on the development fees. 
for ongoing expenses. And then Ellie, you should see that the difference here is a, a lot of what they were paying was $150,000 corporate management fee, which was really built for the development purpose. And since we're kind of changing their platform from less development, and that's on the LHA side, um, they're going to be contributing just mainly to Hearthstone and Lodge. Um, and, and mainly the positions. It's the positions that we don't feel like we get fully funded. At those properties based on the market and what that what like it was. Did you have a fun balance sheet, Kimber? Um, I did not when I um, when I did this <laughs> last Friday, but I have it now. Can you pull that out? So this is our fund balance. Realize these numbers won't really tie back to your individual projects because this is looked at as television consolidated in a whole. So that includes the Briarwood office, the Briarwood apartments, you know, those entities that, that fall into this platform. Um, we are looking at possibly a certain balance in 2025. That's just an estimated balance. Then it'll kind of go through what our developers' fees, and this is obviously the number that's changed. Um, what we're actually getting our management fees for current properties, what rental revenue we're getting in from Briarwood, um, the snow removal, and then you know, just a bug for a little better. And then these are what is happening expenditure wise on all of those properties. So if you were to tie these numbers back to the individual properties, you would have to add them together to come up with these numbers. And then it's just kind of scaling that out at currently at a 4% um, inflation rate um, to kind of get an idea of where our fund balance will be. Now, the ascent um, developer fees are now up, included in here. Last year we had them down in this little red because it was a future event that had closed yet, but that it's closed and we have kind of a document source that I can project off of. Um, those have moved up, but our management fees won't happen until um, closer to the end of 2025. So that's what we're projecting here, and then this would be our adjustment to the fund balance. What Carol would like to also do is um, start creating an operating reserve um, for that at 22% to make sure that we have some reserve scheduled. So we really haven't done that um, as far as a restricted piece that if we need it for whatever reason, maybe it's maybe it's we have a meth unit and we need to loan money to these properties so that we don't have a down unit and we're not losing revenue, but those properties would then pay us back. You know, so little things like that, or if, if we just run into certain circumstances that that we need an operator. So. So it's telling me, so the restricted reserve, well, the restricted reserve is an operating reserve that I want to hold at 22%, so that's basically three months operating expenses. So that's assuming that catastrophic failure and you can't get any revenue for three months, this will carry us for three months. It gives us the capability of what Kendra's saying is to go, well, 
that we have a fund balance of two point seven five, so we have a meth here. So maybe we do it there, or whatever it is. It may make more sense to take it out of the operating reserve based on the. But if we take it out of there, we got to replace it in the next budget year and get twenty two percent. So what really becomes more of a liquid reserve is that line below in terms of what we can use. But what this is also telling me is, and it's a little bit different, but we need a project to come in. Like we need another project around 2028, 2029. Now, that's saying we continue with this. If we want to reduce our reliance on the general fund. And if you look at the administrative fee there, 1.1, 1.3, so if we want to draw that expense down, we need other projects to bring in more management fees because that's the other piece of it. So now I think we're in a good spot to now tactically start deciding when we want projects to come online versus scrambling to get projects on so we can add revenue sources. Um, but financially, yeah, this was actually, I was happy when I saw this because this is not where we were. Um, but from, this is good news. And now we can, you know, so in my mind, 2029, I need one project in that kind of project. If we want to tactically approach it, maybe we shoot for one by 27 and one by 29, but we manage the workload and what we're doing so that we're not killing staff like we are right now when we had Christman, Bill Jomain, Zinnia, and Ascent. So there will be balance brought into the system by doing this. So I know that we went to the end of the 11 and we haven't gone over some of the stuff, so I just need to know, are we ending at 11 or are we going to continue to kind of go over some of this property stuff? I covered most of my report throughout what we were doing. I think um, more of these over here is pretty quick. Yeah, we have a lot of vacancies. <laughs> That's why we might be Oh, I love this little thing down here. Yeah. Is that, can we have that each month? Yeah. yeah. I mean, this is to date for the entire year um, a vacancy yeah. loss. Right. So I think. That's I, a pretty significant amount of money. Do you have any days that you can turn to the regular? I mean, no gap in June and just to basically clean them and go. A week to two weeks, but we're so short staffed. And we have, you know, emergency aid workers, and we have basically three maintenance covering nine properties right now. Plus on calls. So they're overwhelmed. So your average term is 14 days? If it's, if it's, if it's a no damage. Mm -hmm. And it should be shorter than that. That kind of goes back to who's doing it, right? Well, the maintenance staff, so, mm -hmm. um, that number is important. So when we talk to, you know, it's really, I think, depending on your perspective, how you view unit terms, is it's been a bit of a challenge for us. So this number that Lauren's putting in place is an important number because it lets us go look. If you're not doing this, this is why it's costing us, and this is why we're saying here's your benchmark time to turn this. Be, because now we're connecting not doing that to a financial consequence to the organization because it really is negatively impacting the organization financially. So it lets us kind of work them through the numbers. That's also the genesis for the additional maintenance position of Ray Patrick up because if they're all working, maybe Patrick can come in and help with the unit term. Once we stabilize, we've got to stabilize, or maybe it's the property, the maintenance person on property deals with the unit term, and maybe Patrick's covering some of the emergency issues that are being developed. And so that's the issue, but we got to stabilize it. I mean, that's why the contract money is coming in, is to at least stabilize. And I think once we can stabilize and we can get a sense as to what's really happening, it is a, we can't 
can't figure it out because they've never been stable in unit terms. So, and we'll have half of the new team. Right. Well, I think, you know, a while back, quite a while back, it seemed to me that we were told at that time, that turnaround time was in the first from 30 to 60 days, and I thought that was pretty significant. Because that's, you know, almost two times, two times a month, or two months a month. Right. Rent, so, yeah. It depends how the number is. We've got to be careful in the numbers, and maybe we start breaking it down at unit turn times by condition. Because unfortunately, I think having a, good, a unit in good condition is rare. Is rare. So in most cases, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, in most I, cases, in my experience, like yeah. you have one that's like, oh, look at this. I think the only time you see that is if they moved in, they've only been there a year, and they're moving out. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of people who are long-term tenants, mm -hmm. and so there's it's been lived in. And then places like Aspen Meadows neighborhood, and this this is important to know going into having a set coming online. Family yeah, housing so does more damage to yeah, units. Oh yeah. And the bigger the unit, the mm -hmm. longer the, the, longer the turn, the more the materials. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Extends that. The smaller you use, so so we'll so we <laughs> did we fund a full yeah. maintenance yeah. person yeah. for a set? Yes, we did. Full maintenance, full property management. Yes. Yeah. Because it's going to need it. Right. We're sharing. <coughs> okay. Um, do you have anything? Cameras are going to be up and running at Village on Main by, I would say, tomorrow. First Our whole time. property with yes. the camera system. Oh, no, yes. um, so that's very exciting. Waiting for board approval for next week to move forward with the rest of the camera purchases. And then just quick calls for service. Our leading candidate was the Suites at 17. A lot of core follow ups there. Um, second was Fall River at 15, due to a problem from the yeah. resident there. Is the resident still there? Um, not that we know of. Oh, back. Okay. Which one? Uh, one is moved out. Fall River and one has is still there and we have to go through remediation. Yes. That's what the mandatory So we just back. Um, the rest of the properties literally have one or zero. Village I may have a few parking calls that were problematic, but other than that, very little calls. Okay. Cool. The other thing on the cameras that we didn't point out is we weren't able originally when we talked to you all to fund the cameras at the suites. That's part of the funding that I think I don't know if you all mentioned. We will now have the cameras at the suites. That's included yeah. in this. Yeah. Not to cut anybody off, but does anybody have anything that they want to add before we? One thing that you had mentioned last time was you had some extra money in the village on me. <clears throat> and I wondered if there were any items on how to use that. Have you used it? I think we're finalizing that the numbers right now based on what we did add on um, and what is left. So I could talk with you about what that looks like. And the timeline for which to spend it. That's what I thought. Okay. okay. I'm right. going to just send me an email and we'll, about what your thought is and then I'll respond. Okay. So um, we just need a motion to adjourn. Go ahead. Jeff. We're chair.